Welcome to the Fit 15 Podcast Show, where you'll find health and fitness inspiration, motivation, and information shared in 15-minute episodes. Tune in while getting a move on to make leading and enjoying the benefits of a healthy lifestyle almost too easy. It's the Fit 15. And now your host, Katherine Basu. Welcome to the Fit 15 Podcast Show. I'm your host, Katherine Basu. And I have to admit, I'm still pinching myself a little bit here because yesterday I got to talk to Dina Castor and record not only today's episode of the show for you, but also a second episode which will air tomorrow. So you're in for two real treats. If for some reason you don't recognize Dina Castor's name, it's probably because you're not a runner just yet, but hopefully Dina and I will convince you to try running, even if it's just a little bit of running after today's episode. But Dina is a is a big deal in the distance running community. She is the current American record holder in the marathon, and she's held that honor for 15 years. She's also won an Olympic marathon bronze medal. She's won the Chicago Marathon, the London Marathon has 24 U.S. national titles in cross-country track and road racing, currently holds nine American records from the 5K to the marathon. Dina holds the World Masters record in the half marathon and the American Masters record in the full marathon. And if that wasn't enough, if her running accomplishments weren't enough, Dina is also the recently published author of the New York Times bestseller, Let Your Mind Run, a memoir of thinking my way to victory, which is an amazing book that you will definitely enjoy whether you're a runner or not because it talks about the power of positive thinking. So Dina and I do touch on her book a little bit during today's episode. I really enjoyed our conversation. I hope you will too and you're already excited to meet Dina through the podcast after hearing about how inspirational and accomplished she is. I have to say one thing that was really fun about this interview was finding out that Dina and I are both really big fangirls of another author so you'll get to find out who that is if you can't guess from the fact that I try to drop his name whenever I can with any other podcast guest. So that was really fun. And then I do have to also mention and give a little congratulations to Dina because she dropped the fact that she ran a half marathon over this past weekend. And she actually not only ran it, but she won the whole half marathon. So congratulations, Dina, on that. And for everyone else listening, here is my conversation with Dina. Well, welcome to the podcast, Dina. I'm so excited and and truly honored to have you as my guest today. Thank you. It is a a privilege, really, a a great privilege to be with you. Oh, you're so sweet. Well, I had to, I reached out to you, you know, kind of on this, you know, post-marathon runner's high after my last race, because you truly had such a positive impact on my race from the book, and then also something that I know has been a great resource to lots of runners in general, but marathoners in particular, which is Lindsay Hines' podcast, the interview that you had with her. So, I, I didn't. I didn't know if you would say yes or not, and I'm really grateful that you that you did. So thank you for yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> of course. This is that's what the running community is all about. We inspire and encourage and uplift in the in the best ways we know we know how to. So it's a wonderful circle to to be in for sure. Yeah. Well, and, and thank you. Like I said, can't thank you enough for all the the help that you know channeling you during the race yeah. really gave me. So. <laughs> oh, so that's great. Yeah. That is great. Yeah. So, Are you still on that high? I am, you know, it's been a month now, so now I'm I'm kind of in this weird space of, you know, wanting, like, I have my next marathon that I want to do. Maybe I should ask you for recommendations because I'm in Southern California now, so, you know, I, ha- I have to learn all the, the good races out here, but... <laughs> Right. I feel like every weekend there's something going on. I just ran the Mammoth Half Marathon and had so much fun. It's very rare that I get to run a race in my own town because I'm usually the one putting on the event. Um, My husband and I put on a 4th of July Freedom Mile and then a Thanksgiving Turkey Trot. And the San Diego Half Marathon came to Mammoth to put on an event here. This is their sixth year. And cool. I've paced it and made signs and stood on the, the sidelines cheering for people. And this year, I was like, I'm going to do it. And it was like the best tour of our town. They really showcased a, a, a beautiful, the lake space in and the most beautiful okay. views and finishing in town where families were waiting. It was really, really wonderful. That's super. 
I haven't been up there yeah. yet, so I need to get up there and come check it visit. Out. <laughs> it's just a drive through the desert, and you'll be <laughs> right? you'll be at my front door. <laughs> Very cool. But yeah, I think, you know, for me, just the the best part about the race and and why I'm excited is just kind of using the tools that you share, because even though it was my fastest marathon, and I haven't, you know, had the opportunity to do as many as I would have liked, I've had some injuries, you know, but just being able to use that those tools of the power of positive thinking where, you know, during the race, I had like a little twinge in my leg, but trying to change my mindset really helped and just being excited to see where that will take. Because like I said, it, it was my best time marathon but it felt and even though I had some things you know feeling a little off during it it felt really powerful I guess from the from the mindset piece so I don't know I mean like you were the driver like even though things were failing and your body was screaming at you to stop or slow down yet you're still in the driver's seat and that's what that's what really embracing your mindset and um and being creative with it is is all about really right and I think you know maybe you could talk about that piece because I think Often, you know, with runners of any levels I, I chat with, we, we kind of joke about how running is so much mental. And I've always thought about that. But just, the, you know, going through your book, I feel like my I, idea that has changed and just using the strategies more has been so, like instead of thinking of running being, you know, 90 percent mental or whatever we, we might joke about it being, you know, right. and, and taking that as as a as an important piece, actually, like you said, being a driver more. So could you share some insights on how to be a driver more during our races or, or even in life taking it beyond the race. But absolutely. I think, I think, um, really harnessing your, your mindset and your positivity and your optimism with some people and athletes in general think they have to have angst and fear and anger to, mm-hmm. to get them to records or, or rings in competition. And, um, And science has now debunked that, that positivity and optimism actually give your body the hormones to accomplish much greater feats than negativity or anxiety can can do for you. They're very restricting and release cortisol, our stress hormone. So using optimism and um, positivity are definitely more empowering for anybody. And it's not just in athletics, it's in in life in general, that we can be a little more gracious in traffic and try to work with our mindset there. But in in saying that, that running is mental, it really is. Hi, friends, it's Catherine. And if you are joining us, and using the podcast to get in that out and back 15 minute walk. That was your halfway point reminder. We're seven and a half minutes into today's episode, so you want to turn around if you only have 15 minutes. All right, back to Dina. Something we have to condition. Positivity is like a muscle and we have to keep flexing it so that it doesn't atrophy. And um, I like to think of like an angel and a devil on my shoulders because they always seem to be there. Right. And as the race gets harder, a workout gets harder, that devil seems to like puff up and get a little louder. And I always make it a game to try to make him atrophy on my shoulder. And I picture <laughs> him shriveling up and it's just a way to, I mean, it's like the weirdest things that go through our minds, right? But I try to, I try to like see my angel getting all buff and burly and her wings growing bigger mm-hmm. and, um, and this little devil just shrinking and its voice getting really puny. <laughs> and, uh, so it just it's just making a game out of it. And, and really the, the, um, the end result is a much better performance that you got out of yourself physically. So you reached your physical potential by using your mind in a much more creative and constructive way. No, I love that. And so that mental piece is really important with running. I know a piece, another piece that's really important is trusting our training, which is part of the mental piece. Could you talk about that a little bit? Because I know on the, for my podcast, I reach a lot of, you know, beginning runners or beginning exercisers, and I try to encourage them to run because that's my passion and it's, it's meant a lot to me in my life personally and, you know, as a runner myself. So anything you could share about that, just the importance of trusting your training and how that can play into things. Yeah. And the fact that you're encouraging people to run is fantastic because it's really a sport that's open to so many that, Mm -hmm. um, every socioeconomic, religious, um, uh, I just think that we can reach so many people with such a simple sport and, the act of it seems very simple, one foot in front of the other, but right. it can get very complex along the way as right. we as we start to throw in training and to be able to trust that. And we all we, we all dabble in um, in self doubt, and um, and that goes into doubting our training schedule. Is like, yeah, it might have worked for everybody else, but is it really going to work for me? Because I'm I'm not that good. You know, we just set, tend to be self-defeating instead of our best cheerleaders. But it goes through all of our minds. There's times where I get to the night before the race and I've just 
tapered for a week and I all of a sudden feel like I'm, I must be out of shape. Like right. I've taken the week, it's been so easy and all of my 100 mile weeks are behind me or those twenty that 20 mile long run that I got in to show that I could um, sustain the marathon distance and you get the little bit of anxiety that you didn't do enough or run fast enough or more or specific enough. Like we can, we can really just hang on anything or did I eat enough new, like enough pasta the night before? Or am I going <laughs> to bonk? And do I have the right goose? Whatever. I mean, we could just sit there and go through, go through a laundry list of, of, of self doubt. But in that, in those moments, I always try to hang on the reasons that I should succeed mm-hmm. because it's always the it's always the art of paying attention to the right things because sure. you know we can we can list the excuses but um, that we should fail but we can also list the excuses of of succeeding and so I always try to shift that conversation in my head over to okay so here are some things that that I may not have gotten right or that I'm scared about but what are the reasons that I should really succeed in my goal and when you start paying attention to to those reasons then you start to puff up and feel a little more confident and and the doubt and worry seem to recede into the background I love that. So, I love, yeah, yeah. I so you had a great example in the book when you were talking about, you know, your preparations for when you ended up getting the the master's uh, <laughs> record. Yeah, and that was really the epitome of so many years of 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 then trusting in it. Once my once my husband, who's my coach now, um, gave me the reasons I should succeed instead of the the story that was going on in my mind that my allergies were bothering me. I had the flu, the California fires debilitated some of my preparation. And and he shifted my attention to, well, you got in your longest long runs in the past decade, your longest tempo runs of your entire career. You're running sub five minute miles on your mile repeats. Like I'd say you're ready. And I'm like, I'll be darned. Like, why wasn't I paying attention? The the person that's been like practicing positivity and even writing a book about it at the time, I was thinking, man, I I really got it wrong here. And so I just completely put the excuses aside and and hung on his story. And then even in the race, trying like just trying to um, every choice that I made in that race to dig down or give up or to be stressed out that I missed a water bottle or or um, be flexible and say, I'm just going to grab what's available on the course so I can get in those calories. It was just constantly shifting that attention to, um, to pursuing my goal. And at any one of those, any one of those moments, I could have failed in the attempt just by choosing wrong. Mm -hmm. And instead I kept choosing to persist and be flexible and resilient. And I ended up being able to accomplish that goal. So to me, that was the epitome of all the practices I've put into place over the years. Sure. And something that I think, you know, many runners or even, you know, not maybe listeners who are not runners yet, because we want to encourage them to try, (laughs) could probably relate to just in any, any sport, any endeavor, you know, trying to go out there and, and not feeling a hundred percent and maybe wanting to quit even the weeks before or that day and and not, not show up. So it was just amazing how you had that same experience and, you know, you're able to accomplish what you did. So, right. So our, our, our mindset and our, um, and our thinking is always a choice. And, and it's it's funny how things pop up in our in our heads, whether it's feeling defeated or discouraged or frustrated or fearful, they can pop up. And it's really important to acknowledge that that feeling, but then say, you know what, can I redefine this feeling so that I, I'm not owning the fear and disappointment and um, and use it in a way that I can persist and whether that's helping a little girl in the first grade cross a bridge that doesn't have railings on it because she's so scared. And I said, yeah, you can be scared, but when we get to the other side, you're then courageous. And she was like, what? (laughs) And we walked holding hands across this bridge together on a field trip. And she was just so proud of herself because she overcame that fear. So I was trying to explain to her, it's okay to be fearful, but you're going to be more courageous than fearful once you get to the other side. And she loved to, she loved that option, you know, like even though she's scared, she could still be courageous. And um, so I think it's important to, to honor those feelings. And in the, in the book, I, um, I was brought to light by feeling completely crushed and disappointed after a race. And instead of feeling like a failure, which I did initially feel like a failure because I went from confident to crushed in the span of three miles. Mm-hmm. Um, instead of feeling like a failure, 
my coach was able to show me that disappointment meant that I cared and that I was engaged and invested and that I expected more out of myself. So darn it, get back to the drawing board and and keep working. You know, he would say Rome wasn't built in a day. So let's get back to work and keep building this athlete that you want to become. And I just thought that that was one of the most valuable lessons that I've ever learned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No feelings are bad. Just, you know, Letting, yeah. letting yourself feel them and then t- try to take it in another direction, yes. right? Yes, and I really feel we just have to define them in a way that empowers us, that mm-hmm. they, can, they can feel icky at first, but how can we redefine them, redefine these, um, these emotions that make us feel uncomfortable and make them work for us? Mm-hmm. I love that. And I don't yeah. know, Dina, if you have any insights on, on this. I loved kind of reading in the book just how, you know, the, the run that you did, the 18-mile run you did before deciding you wanted to run the marathon. And I'm always trying to – I know it's a, it's a big feat, and it's maybe not for everyone to, to run the marathon, but I know, you know, growing up, you're running cross-country. I thought, one day I'll, I'll do the marathon, maybe. Like, it was very <laughs> hypothetical. Right. But after doing it, I just feel it's so empowering. I don't know if you have any insights or just thoughts on that for people who – might be in that one day space about, you know, trying to consider it for themselves and why they might want to try. Right. And for some people, it seems impossible to just run a mile. Right. Like you run, <laughs> when you tell someone you ran 10 miles one day, they're like, oh my God, I don't even think I drive that much in my car. Like all those, right. all those things you hear from people. And so even a mile seems daunting sometimes. But then once you, like you're, we're meant to adapt, we're meant to move as human beings. And once you realize, or once you get to that mile, you feel like a superhero. And then once you get this training plan, hopefully you don't look at the 20 miler that's right. months down the road because that could be intimidating. But then there's a Sunday morning that you just ran 20 miles. That is unbelievable. And then you get to the race itself. And you can only run a marathon if you prepare for it because our bodies aren't just meant to go out and and run that distance to sustain that um, calorically we're not meant to. So now we have all these tools to be able to go out there and accomplish 26.2 miles. But there's fans on the course. There's signs just Mm -hmm. for you. You're hitting signs for more power, giving high fives, <laughs> seeing the encouragement, some funny signs, some sentimental signs, but people along the 26 miles that are cheering for you. And then you get to the finish line and get to celebrate in any way you want, whether it's your fist pump, whether it's crying and your hands on your face. <laughs> and it's such a beautiful scene to see so many people accomplish something so heroic. Mm. Mm-hmm. No, I love that. No, yeah. It even makes me emotional to think about it. Right. <laughs> because it's such an amazing feat. It really is. It's extraordinary. <sighs> and the feelings are, are equal. You know, like, oh my gosh, I just did that. It's really, really amazing. Right. No, absolutely. No, I love that. And I don't know. I mean, in the book, you talk about some books that you've read that have been inspirational. I don't know if you've had any, any since the book has been published that you've looked at, if you've been wanting to look at books after writing one. <laughs> Yeah, I think after writing, I could not wait to just have quiet time and read because I hadn't been reading for for over a year. So it was really exciting to start getting through my pile that just kept growing of books that I that I wanted to read. Um, I'll say some of the some of the most inspiring books are The Art of Learning by Josh Waitzkin. Okay, he's a chess player and. Um, And he just has this mind that's just insatiable. Like he just wants to learn more and figure more out about Mm -hmm. himself, about others. And um, so his um, his book, The Art of Learning, was fascinating. And then um, Sean Acor, who's a Harvard professor, wrote The Happiness Advantage. I know I'm such a huge fan of him. He wrote The Happiness Advantage. And I feel like um, I rely on that book a lot just to reinforce um, what I'm trying to do Mm -hmm. with create a, a, a positive a positive life and, um, and, and to allow running to, to be fueled by that optimism as well. I love him. I'm I'm so glad because I, you know, I saw when I got your book, I'm like, Oh, Sean Aker wrote a review for you. And I I love anytime. (laughs) I nearly died when he agreed to blurb my book. I'm like, are you kidding me? Oh my gosh. (laughs) Because I'm upset ever since I saw his Ted talk, I've been obsessed with him and I have, you know, somewhere in my pile here, but I do have his books, you know, like, with the little tabs in them. And it's just that power of the small actions we can take, right? We often think that we can't do much as one person, but also that we can't change our attitude, you know, our attitude or mindset, you know, 
but he proves that there's just these small things we can do to impact others and ourselves. It's just so powerful. Yes. And that, and that one person can change a lot, mm -hmm. but he's also into collaboration. Like yes. when we're helping others, then others help us and help the group and that expands. And it's like that, that butterfly effect of, um, of, of positivity and how powerful it can be. His Ted talk is, he is the best. It yes. is the best <laughs> TED Talk in the in the thousands of inspirational, inspiring um, TED Talks that are out there. I fell in love with unicorns and with with him and his <laughs> books uh, after after listening to him. That's what I see now. Now I have you to back me up that everyone needs to go listen to his TED Talk. But yes. but I always try to tell them that you know there's a unicorn in it, so you have to you have to want to listen yes. to that alone. <laughs> so. That is right. He's a great storyteller. Like yeah. aside aside from being. Um, Aside from allowing science to back up his findings and, and his teachings, he is also a fantastic storyteller. Yep. And definitely in great humor. I mean, whenever, when I read his book, I'm always giggling out loud to myself. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. He's fantastic. Awesome. And yeah. one last thing I wanted to ask you about, Dina, with the running aspect of our conversation is the importance of nutrition. And, and I mean, you mentioned some things that came up in the book that, you know, in your running journey. But and you also love, you know, cooking and baking, which not all runners do. Could you talk about just the importance of that as we're trying to work on our training and improve our, our goals and things you've learned maybe? Yeah, there, nutrition is so important on so many levels. At um, on, on one level, I think it is really important to value yourself enough to put together really quality ingredients and a, and a mean meal and, and nurture your body because you, you deserve to be treated well. You deserve that kindness and, and high quality in your life. Um, but also the, um, the nutrients in, in, in good organic fresh produce and in high quality meats and fish and protein choices. Um, even the homemade ice cream I just made um, to put on top of grilled peaches with my shortbread that I put on top. Like I have a sweet tooth, but I also want that to be really good quality. Mm. And, um, and so I think that when you're putting those quality ingredients in yourself, you're, um, you're, you're feeding your body the nutrients it needs to thrive. So you're, you're able to produce the proper hormones and absorb the right minerals and vitamins to be able to operate optimally, both mentally and physically, and actually emotionally and spiritually also. So it's, it's all combined. Like nutrition is our, is the way that we can add uh, an entire health to our to our body. And so to me, a sound mind, my sponsor is ASICS. They have been for 18 years and it's a Latin acronym for anima sana incorpore sano or a sound mind in a sound body. Mm -hmm. And I feel like nutrition is the, the support to be able to have that sound mind and sound body. So we can work our mentality and we can work our physical bodies, but it's good nutrition and good rest that kind of mm. help nurture both of those things. That's, you know, it's funny, I, I had your episode with Lindsay Heim playing when I was driving up to run my race. And my, so now my husband knows like all your insights and tips. So he was like, make sure, you know, after listening to, to Dina, you have to make sure you recover well. And I'm like, hey, you know, Yo, that's so funny. He's holding you accountable. <laughs> yes. We got to watch what we let them listen to. And then I, I've been telling him, you know, because he, he thought I, he had these, this crazy goal that was not feasible, you know, time-wise, this time around with my training. And, and he kept telling me I had to promise him I was going to run that goal. And so I started pulling out, well, you know, if you if you give me a massage, that's what it takes to be an Olympian and, and run a really good time. Like Dina Castor's has – and then, then he found out that, that Andrew was right. actually a massage therapist. So he was like, wait a minute here. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait a second. You know, and there's that thing that the cobblers, the cobblers kid, don't have shoes because they're busy making <laughs> right. um, uh, making shoes for everybody in the community, money makers, I guess. But um, I feel fortunate that he was a massage therapist and I got massages. Yeah, it was so pretty yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, too funny. Well, I yeah. loved being able to, to chat, you know, running with you and have some of your insights for our listeners, whatever level they're at, whether they want to run that first mile or, or cross a bridge even. I mean, hey. <laughs> Right, right. And you know, we were talking about that 18 mile run to the beach and back that inspired me to run a marathon. But there was there was a number of runs before that that hooked me on the sport in different mm -hmm. ways, like to go explore on a trail 
even if it was just walking and jogging in a new place that was like a little more technical, it's like those moments that are like, wow, I feel so privileged to be able to move in this environment and see Mm. these things. So um, I would encourage anyone to just go out and give themselves an opportunity to feel that way. Because sometimes we get on our treadmills and our basements and it's dark and musky and, and we're in sloppy clothes and we're just trying to get through it. Like give yourself a, give, give yourself a environment to really enjoy it. So invite a friend to go explore somewhere or do it in a beautiful park near you so that you can feel safe and um, and make it an enjoyable process so that you can be hooked on it because we want people to not just run a marathon, but we want people to make a healthy lifestyle out of putting one foot in front of the other. Yeah, for sure. Hi, friends. It's Catherine, and I'm cutting in to end my conversation with Dina for you today, but do want to just kind of give a little nod to what she shared there at the end that even if you don't have marathon goals currently or ever or aren't really into running currently and don't think you ever will be just that it's so important to be focused on trying to get healthy and live a healthy lifestyle and the benefits of that so shout out to you for spending time listening to a podcast show that is meant to inspire you to work on your health and fitness obviously you have lots of choices when it comes to how you spend your time and I greatly appreciate you for tuning into this podcast but definitely give you credit for wanting to get inspired on your own health and fitness journey whether it includes running or not so thank you for that tomorrow's episode with Dina will focus more on her transition from just being a runner to becoming a mother and then becoming an author more recently so if you are interested in that be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss that episode. If you are loving the podcast, be sure to leave us a review on iTunes and or Stitcher and tell a friend to tune in as well. All right. I hope to chat with you tomorrow. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Fit 15. For show notes and more, visit fitarmadello.com slash podcast. See you next time.